Hello again, this is the second part of the uh, video on temporary anchorage devices biomechanics with some clinical considerations. The main reference is the Biomechanical Foundation of Clinical Orthodontics, that's by uh, Burston and Choi. It's a very valuable book to read. I do advise you to pick up a copy from your library or buy a copy from the link down in the description. Now we'll be talking today about uh, seven different subjects and we'll start with molar uprightening. The first technique to upright a molar is simply by putting a simple wire and a coil spring attached to a tad and just by directly pushing this tooth distally the distance from it to the CR is going to make the D so you'll have a moment that's going to rotate and upright this tooth. As you can see in this clinical picture, the wire shouldn't be a rectangular wire, it can be just a simple round wire, and the wire can just easily pass through the hole inside this uh, TAD. It needn't be this uh, crosshead design of the TAD. So it's a very simple and easy, effective method. Another design is to put a retromolar TAD inside the retromolar area and then attach it to an attachment and button on the tooth and just pull that tooth distally and since it's quite away from the CR it's also going to generate a momentum which is the same. However, not every patient this is possible because there is sometimes thick uh, soft tissue here which may make putting the uh, TAD quite difficult. In this clinical situation, it was uh, okay and seems like the soft tissue didn't hinder that much. You can put the button more medially, like in this case, but I think uh, that it's okay and probably preferable to put it on the distal side. That's when possible, but if you look in the, the side view, if they placed it on the distal side here, it would have just occluded with the maxillary tooth and probably prevented them from actually placing it. So they chose to put it on the mesial side and just pull that tooth back and derotate it. However, I would personally prefer to put a bite block here on the distal cusps uh, to elevate the bite and at the same time just put some pressure on these distal cusps to aid into rotating the tooth backwards. But you should take care that if it's severely rotated, as you put pressure here on the distal cusp, it may be more anterior to the CR and hence usually tip the tooth rather than the desired distally tipping. The third technique is by using uprightening springs aided by TADS. And as you can see, this uprightening spring, which may be made out of TMA wire or stainless steel wire, with an additional coil or without a coil and it is de designed so that you elevate it up and hook it up on the tad and this way it's going to generate a moment that's going to distally tip the molar. Sometimes you don't want to distally tip the crown to create space here. You want to just move the root forward and in this case you may cinch back the wire distally or put an auxiliary power chain from the uh, hook here to the tad so that the crown of the molar does not go any further distally. And this is a clinical case here. You would notice that uh, initially it wasn't cinched back so that the tooth can distally tip. And as the space here is opening up, the wire was cinched back so that now there is more root movement. Another technique is by using power chain on lever arms and as this lever arm is there it's going to protract this tooth and to some degree create some moment. However, I wish that they would have made the power arm longer and even longer than this one since the CR is somewhere down here and the lower you take your power arm the more you're going to become with the level of the CR and you are going to have some rotation of this uh, molar. The second topic is molar intrusion. And molar intrusion has been become very popular, especially to deal with anterior open bite cases in which you would uh, intrude molars of the upper teeth 
or of the lower teeth. However, I do find this design quite uh, unsafe to put TADS in the lower lingual area because it is very close to the lingual nerve and, uh, and vessels, but uh, it is there. There are several designs in which you would intrude upper molars. If you just take a TAD here and try from the buccal side to intrude, you end with intrusion, but the molar moves buccally. And at the same time, the palatal cusps, they stick down like this, creating some interference in occlusion. You can have other alternatives, like to help the TAD pull this tooth up, you do some type of torque inside the wire. And this uh, lingual torque of the crown can aid in sustaining the position of the crown. However, it's very difficult that you make this torque precise and it is going to translate to the neighboring teeth. And the, as the tooth moves a little bit, then the torque is going to change dramatically. So it's very difficult to actually measure. Another technique is to use the wire, the arch wire, a little bit narrower than it in the full arch. This is going to have some lingual force pushing on the tooth in a lingual direction. Together with the vertical direction, it's going to prevent the flaring of these molars. A more practical design is to put a transpalatal arch. And this transpalatal arch is going to make this type of movement quite difficult. So you can have both sides from both sides uh, buckle uh, tads only and intrude. However, by far the easiest and most predictable technique is to have intrusion from the palatal side and from the buccal side and work accordingly. You can increase force here or here according to the tooth, how it's moving. In most cases, it's going to move more or less bodily. However, if you're intruding from one side or even from both sides, you don't actually need brackets. You can just put a wire with some composite and attach it with a power chain to a TAD and it's going to do the same job. Sometimes it's difficult to place TADs right here between the six and seven as they are very distal, far away. Sometimes the space between the roots is quite uh, small. So you can place them between the four and five and intrude these teeth. And as you intrude them, you curve the wire in an RCS bend like this one. And this is going to contribute to intrusion of the six and seven as the four and five are being pulled up. In addition, you can make this boot type of uh, bend. And this bend is going to also contribute to the flexibility and increase the uh, reliability of the wire to intrude the six and seven. But sometimes you don't need such things. You can just have two types of tads, one in the posterior, one in the interior, and just pass up an arch wire. And here you can attach multiple teeth to this wire and therefore it's going to be very convenient. Or you can just attach it directly to the wire instead of attaching it to the teeth. If you attach power chain to the teeth, it's going to flare these teeth buccally. But if you attach them to the wire, the wire is going to pull the teeth all up in one segment. So it's important then when you place your TADs to have your TADs and the, the vectors of force unite to make a a force that passes through the CR of the molar. From the buccal side, you need a force that is more medially and distal to the tooth. So as you pull them from both sides, it goes through the CR of the tooth. If you had a bar like the, the time, the, the slide before that, you could probably put some attachment here on the, on the arch wire and pull straight up through here. From the buccal and lingual, it's important that the forces pass through from the buccal and lingual so that the resultant also passes through the CR. You can make one force more distally and one more medially so that the resultant force passes through the CR. And this is a design like this. I, we don't like designs like this in which the, uh, uh, the forces are bent. And in this case, the six is going to be distally inclined 
and the seven is going to be more medially inclined this is not going to help with intrusion but if you attach an arch wire and you make the forces more uh, parallel to the long axis of the teeth they're going to move straight up without any horizontal components also sometimes it's difficult to place tads very posterior like in this case where you're intruding an extruded seven so it's easier to place the tad between the five and six and place a lever arm which is going to place some force to intrude this uh, seven lingually and buckily but by far my best technique if you're treating anterior open bite is to put a wire and put some composite on it and these composite bite blocks they're going to open the bite and the patient is going to bite on them and as he bites on them that's going to aid in intrusion of these teeth by the occlusion at the same time if you put a tad palatally and lingually and make it pass over the embrasure area here it's going to try and put some force on these teeth and intrude them I would extend this wire on all the teeth which are in occlusion whether six seven eight until we end up with all the teeth that are in occlusion and it's quite an effective method and at the same time it's relatively easy to make sometimes you only have one tooth which needs to be intruded and in these cases you can place one tad mesially one tad distally one more buccally one more lingually and just pass a power chain on top of that and that's going to provide a sinking down force the horizontal force here is of no importance since it's neglected these tads do not move and the horizontal force is negligible the important force is the intrusion force the next topic is incisor intrusion and when you're intruding incisors from tads the tads are more labial to the incisors and the uh, the uh, brackets are also labially positioned and so these vertical forces are going to procline the incisors and increase overjet this is a very important consideration when you're trying to intrude to resolve incre increased incisal show or gummy smile that you will end up with an increased overjet so in the beginning of my days when I started it back in 2005 I used to put the tad here in the middle and intrude these teeth up this was because one tad costs half than two tads and it created quite a lot of uh, soft tissue problems with the frenum so then we started doing it on the side of the uh, of the uh, frenum but we noticed that it was quite a lot of uh, proclination happening especially in these cases a lot of them they were uh, uh, already with class 2 division 1 cases and it wasn't helping at all so we moved them to the side between the 1 and 2 that helped but still wasn't good enough because the CR of the anterior teeth is actually located between the 2 and 3 and therefore the best place to put it was between the 2 and 3 and that was this caused much less uh, proclination of the incisors than placing it more anteriorly however this does have another problem and that is it creates a lot of intrusion force on the canine and the lateral area and as we said in part one of the lecture that uh, if you extract force and you retract on tads the canines they're going to move up and this is going to cause a roller coaster effect and if you have intrusion forces which are very close to the canine as well that's not going to help you're going to have double amount of intrusion force on the canine one coming from the distal tad and one coming from the mesial tad and that's why it's not a very good design a better design would be to place the tad between two and three and put the attachment more anteriorly this is going to increase the intrusive force on the incisors rather than on the canine and have some retractive forces on the incisors which is going to prevent the proclination of these incisors however this uh, design does have its flaws i don't like that uh, it's placed directly on the on the wire 
which is going to aid in rotating the lateral incisor as it's quite distalizing to the lateral incisor. A better approach would be to put a crimpable stop or probably a coil like this and attach the elastic directly to the wire rather than mesial to the tooth. In the lower arch the same mechanism happens. Uh, sometimes the tad is placed in the middle and sometimes to the lateral sides. If you want to procline the lower incisors you can place it in the middle. If you don't want to procline them then putting them between two and three would be the best of choice. Another design sometimes when you've already placed tads in the posterior region like between the sixes and uh, fives and you have finished retracting and you don't need these anymore or sometimes it's difficult to place tads between one and two or two and three and that's because of the proximity of the roots or the, because you're retracting and this may interfere with the roots you can use this intrusion arch and this intrusion arch is quite simple to make you just insert it into the cross head of the tad and place this wire which is supposed to go up like this you push it down and then put it between the two and three because you want your forces of intrusion to be here to pass through the CR of the interior segment. The other topic is total arch intrusion and nowadays it's become so much more common that people want to intrude all the arch because of inter, uh, the gummy smiles or the increased incisal show and you want to intrude the posterior teeth and the interior teeth this will solve the gummy smile as well as if you intrude all the maxillary arch you get an auto rotation of the mandible which is going to move forward and give you less uh, overjet a more prominent chin and sometimes in this essence it uh, is something replacing surgery Ideally, to accomplish this, you don't need to intrude anteriorly and posteriorly. If you want intrusion of all the arch and retraction, then you can just make one force system that passes through the CR of the maxilla, and this is going to retract and intrude all the maxilla. But because it's very difficult to locate the CR of the maxilla, you can place a force system which relies on two tads. One of them more anterior, one is more posterior and have two elastics. And in this case, if you get a more clockwise rotation of the maxilla, then you increase the force of one tad. And if you get a counterclockwise rotation, you increase the force of the other tad. And then you just follow up the patient and you make sure that you, there is a balance between the anterior and the posterior tad force systems. The other topic is scissor bite and correcting of bites is quite difficult intraorally. If you have a bilateral case in which the sevens have erupted more labially and the problem is because of the upper teeth, then a transpalatal bar would be a very good choice in which it is symmetrical and you can pull the teeth more gingivally and labially, lingually. So it's going to correct the vertical problem and the horizontal problem by pulling these sevens both lingually and gingivally so that you get intrusion and palatal movement. But that's only when it's symmetrical and when the major problem is in the upper teeth. And this can be accomplished by just pushing these teeth to the inside in simple cases by a narrow wire in more difficult cases by a transpalatal arch and although theoretically it is possible to torque the arch wire and make the wire give the torque but this is not feasible clinically it is so difficult to have uh, the amount of torque that's required and by just a little movement of the molar then everything will change and it's going to be very difficult to maintain this amount of torque it's much easier to just push these teeth towards the right place and even without an arch wire in place just pull the teeth and as they are pulled towards the palatal they're going to rotate around CR which is going to give a satisfactory result. However when you have a unilateral problem then placing one tad on one side and pulling them is much more feasible than placing a transpalatal arch 
especially it's not going to have any side effects on the other side of the arch. If the TAD is more interior, then you can just place a lever arm and this can be used and it's going to transfer the forces more posteriorly on the sevens because a lot of times in these areas have a very thick soft tissue and it's quite difficult to insert TADs more posterior. There is another technique here which is shown that you ha can have multiple teeth which are in cross bite or scissor bite sorry and you want to pull them lingually instead of having so many TADs you can just have one arch wire that unites them and attach them all together on this TAD. It is sometimes preferred to put the TAD in the mid suture because here you've got thicker bone and they will survive more. However, in my clinical practice, I don't like placing TADs here in the middle because look at this power chain. It is so traumatic. I'd rather place a longer uh, screw that passes here, somewhere here and the TADs are going, the, these power chains, they're going to be so much shorter and they're going to exert more intrusive force and lingual force. And this intrusive force in scissor bite correction is something which is positive. It's something that will aid in the correction of the scissor bite. Although many people would argue that we can use cross elastics and just open the bite from one side and put uh, cross elastics and these cross elastics, they're going to rotate the molars and do the job. This is right, but these cross elastics have vertical components and these vertical components are going to extrude these molars. And sometimes the molars will extrude faster than they actually tip towards correction. And if they extrude, then you'll have to elevate the bite from the other side even more. And then they extrude and you have to elevate the bite. And that's not something which is nice. And even if they'd managed to actually tip them into good occlusion, you end up with a bite turbo on that side. Once removed, you have such an open bite on that side. So you get good occlusion here, open bite on the other side. Now you need to intrude these. It is much more feasible if you only used both techniques at the same time. You put a tad on the lingual of the upper and on the buckle of the lower and you tip and intrude at the same time. So you correct the vertical and you correct the horizontal at the same time. And when you end up with an occlusion, you end up with a right occlusion. So there's no open bite on the other side. And this is a clinical example of a tad which is placed in the buckle shelf area here and it is pulling these six and seven out of this lingual version so that they would upright and therefore correct the scissor bite. The next topic is correction of occlusal cant. In many cases, correcting occlusal cants will involve intrusion by tads of one side while leaving the unaffected side the same. But as you intrude this side, it's going to rotate the maxilla towards that side, shifting the midline to this side. And therefore you'll need an, another force from that side, just pulling that side to, the, um, to correct the midline. So as you intrude here, you retract here, and this is going to give you the balance to correct the, and preserve the midline. However, as you intrude the upper arch, you don't really need the lower arch but it is preferable that you intrude from the lingual side and the labial side. If you retract the intrude only on the labial side, you end up with flaring of these teeth buccally, which is something that you do not want to do in these cases. As you've finished intrusion of the maxillary arch, you start extruding the lower arch and you can use an, uh, a spring like this one, which is an, an extraction or an extrusion spring to the lower teeth. However, I would generally prefer to give an intermaxillary elastics in which I attach a hook to the wire and give the patient a vertical elastics to attach from the hook on the lower wire to the tad itself, which now is of no use after finishing the uh, intrusion of the maxillary arch. The next topic is using endosseous uh, implants. And endosseous implants are not part of orthodontics, but nowadays we face ourselves with a lot of cases 
especially adults who have them already installed. But they can be easily used because the, these teeth don't move. These implants stay stable and they are just like TADs. They will not move and you can use them to protract molars against them because as they are locked here, they're not going to move. Or you can use them to retract anterior teeth because as the same thing, these teeth, they're not going to move. Another case is a case of mine, which this patient had done implants. She, she didn't have any posterior teeth at all. So she done implants on both sides and there's a bridge here spanning from the three to the seven and from the three to the seven. But she ended up with an increased uh, overjet, which she wanted to get rid of. So all we had to do is just place brackets on the six interior teeth. We didn't have to go back because this bridge is just one unit. And this place here is an endosseous implant. So it's a rock stone. It's not going to move. I don't need more brackets posteriorly. So I just done some interproximal reduction and a simple wire and some retraction. And within a few months, she had already had the overject corrected and she was happy with the results. Lastly, there's a technique which I noticed and that's sometimes if you have missing molars or you have missing teeth and you want to retract on them, it's quite difficult to maintain the uh, interarch integrity where you want the arch wire to span all the way to the back so that you get your arch form corrected. It's, you can retract fours and fives, but it's difficult that you get this arch form, especially in the horizontal component. So one technique would be to place tads, one or two, and put some composite buildup and put some attachment and pass the wire through it. I've seen slides of people who have congenitally missing laterals and these people are adolescents and they cannot put permanent implants and some clinicians will put a large uh, tad and put some composite buildup on top of it and it will serve for a few years by the time the patient becomes an adult and he can have a permanent endosseous implant. I hope you found this lecture interesting. I have several other lectures in the uh, YouTube channel and I've arranged them into playlists as orthodontic biomechanics, undergraduate orthodontics, postgraduate orthodontics, and TAD workshop. And I hope you can go through them and see anyone which is of interest. If you have any comments, please write them in the comment section and I would be happy to answer them. If you found this video uh, interesting, please give it a thumbs up, share it with friends, and you can subscribe to the channel from here. You can press the bell icon so that it notifies you whenever we upload a new video. This is the playlist for the whole biomechanics uh, lectures. And this is the latest biomechanical lecture that uh, has been uploaded recently. Thank you for listening.